And you have younger directors today, uh, and it's a good thing, I think. But I remember I, the year after I became director of the museum, you know, I joined the uh, American Association of Art Museum Directors. So I go to my first meeting in L.A. At the, and it's hosted at the L.A. County, and I was going to go, and I'd, I probably out of, at that time, there might have been 75 member directors. It was like going to a meeting of dads. Got Jim Ballinger here. Thank you for coming. Well, glad to be here, Mark. Yeah, we've you've been on my hit parade for a long time. <laughs> well, that's good. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot of reasons, but I think to understand how the a, a museum works, because you were the director for 40 years, um, is a rare opportunity. Not many people do that. But I actually want to start with how in the world did you end up coming from Kansas? So you grew up in Kansas, right? Grew up in Kansas, right in Kansas, in yeah. the south end of Kansas City. And what, what did your folks do? Oh, my dad was a chemical engineer and vice president of a chemical company, and my uh, mom had worked in a medical office and then had my brother and I, and we ended up being competitive tennis players, so she became the person who got us places where we needed to be and things like that. And, and so where Kansas was this? Uh, well, it's I grew up in a, in a town called Leewood, which is a suburb of Kansas City in uh -huh. Johnson County. It's about uh, you know it's a it's a complex city in many ways. You know, it, there's two states, which is what makes Kansas City famous. Right. There's State Line Road. Right. Um, You're on the Kansas side. Yeah, right? so we're on the Kansas side, not by much. I was actually born in Missouri, but grew up in in Kansas. And there's also five counties come together and. 27 town sites, uh -huh. you know, it's not like Phoenix where I ended up spending so much time has that many town sites, but it's all in Maricopa County dead right. center in Arizona. Right. So you don't have as many crazy things that kind of go on. I mean, what was really wild. I remember as a, as a kid, there's literally an accident on a bridge that was going over state line road and the ambulance came on both sides and wouldn't go on there and the person died because they were terrified of jurisdiction oh, yeah. i mean uh, then they had to create some kind of a you know safe haven yeah. so i don't know what they did but i mean i just remember that as a kid boy you go wow that's bureaucracy in action right and so you grow up in in a in a pretty big city really yeah yeah, yeah. i'm a city i'm a i'm a, a city, city guy i mean we were out on the perimeter of town, if, if uh, you know, as a kid, you went a quarter of a mile out the back door, we were in cornfields. Oh, yeah. And now if I go back there, and we lived on like 92nd Street, that was pretty much the end of Kansas City. And now, I, I don't know, it goes out to 239th Street uh -huh. or something, you know, something like that. So it's like... And were you Arizona. interested in art at that time when you were a kid? I'm talking about not, like not really. School, what I was even, interested in were school. I was fascinated with antiques. My mom loved antiques. We'd go to antique stores a lot. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, not that it had a huge bearing on anything, but the, the very first memory I have in life is my great aunt painting. Mm. Um, she was a painter, obviously, and uh, my mom. We we bought a house. I would have been two, two and a half years old. Yeah. And uh, Aunt Mary came and she was, and my mom asked her to do a, a painting on a window divider between two rooms. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there fascinated with that. Uh -huh. um, and not that I became an artist or anything like that, but I, that was just you know one of those funny things that Later on in life, ironically, I came around full circle, ended up in a place I never thought I'd be. And did that stay in your house? Was it right? I mean, did you grow yeah, up seeing that Yeah, painting? we were in that house till I was out of college. Uh -huh. And uh, I have other paintings by her. She taught summer school sometimes at the Chicago Art Institute. She's a pretty good landscape yeah, so painter. Was good. I mean, not... What was her, what's a shout out to Aunt yeah. Mary? What was her name? <laughs> her name was Mary Frances. So, yeah. My, it's my a, mom's name was Mary yeah. Frances. Anyway, so... You know, we did that. And my the first art exhibition I ever saw uh -huh. uh, was at the Nelson Adkins Art Museum in Kansas City, and it was an exhibition of Winston Churchill's paintings. And he was an okay painter, right? And not that I knew, but yeah, yeah. it was a 
and I had this catalog for a long time with um, the, our dog chewed a corner of it, but I had that catalog. Uh-huh. And how old were you <laughs> at that time? Uh, it must have been in the late 50s probably. And how old were you? I would have been 10, maybe, okay. something like that. So, and you kept it? Yeah. So something yeah, it's was funny, resonating. You know, but I always liked antique shops and stuff. And well, What would you, you know, collect or buy or look at? What was your interest in that? Well, I, I wasn't really a collector. I was, you know, on my, just with my mom buying. She just loved things and uh-huh. you know, had them throughout the house and pretty much it. So you enjoyed going with her, but yeah, really. The, yeah, the, it wasn't me. And my yeah. brother, and the, my first thing I ever collected, my brother and I had a, a uh, pretty sizable baseball card collection, which wouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, but the interesting thing came out of that was, and that's back when baseball cards were worthless. Right. I mean, literally right, worthless. Right. And not, then we did it because we were kids. I mean, right. what else? But my parents had two friends uh, who were tennis players who had grown up as kids, you know, and, and they collected baseball cards. Well, they gave us their cards so we had this huge collection from the 1920s oh my through the 19 into the early 60s and when my dad died sadly when i was in college um you know we we sold them all at a at at a garage sale basically who knows for what did you thirty-five dollars? Did you something? have any great ones? Do well, I, I don't remember specifically, but I remember when baseball cards, you know, kind of took off as a collectible, <laughs> and you'd see a picture in some magazine. Oh, this this thing sold for a thousand dollars. I'd go, yeah, we had three of those. And then, <laughs> is that right? You yeah, right? yeah, oh but gosh. it was pretty funny. So yeah. you know, not that they were, you know, like these million-dollar things that you read about yeah. today. But well, you know, it was maybe just, you don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, you probably don't know, but. <laughs> Uh, it was one of those sad days, you know, when you go back and say, man, I wish I could have hung on to that stuff. And we might have, had we been able to, but, you know, when you're in college, I'm in an right. apartment, or I don't have any space for anything. Right, my, usually the mom my brother was out. three years older than I was, so he wasn't much further advanced in wanting to keep things. And just, you know, that's 1971. And yeah, I have all that. my comics that I kept, every one of them, yeah. in mint condition. Yeah. So... I have no idea what there was. Comic people out there, let me know if you're yeah. really interested. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I want to sell. Yeah. So, but you were interested in tennis, so and you were yeah, good at I, it. Yeah, my brother was really my, well. Backs up. My parents were real tennis people. We grew up at the Rock Hill Tennis Club. My dad had played on the University of Illinois um, tennis team. Oh yes, he was good. And played, and so we, as kids, were we kind of grew up as tennis kids, and turned out this club turned out some pretty good players so we ended up you know doing this and ended up as a tennis player that went around to tournaments all over the country for junior tennis and things and it was compared played my first tennis tournament when i was seven. Oh my and uh, when i finished i went to university of kansas on tennis scholarship and i um moved to phoenix which you think is tennis heaven so i took a year off I'm still in my year off. Uh-huh. Uh, just other things interceded and I never went back. So when you, when you're a kid, I would have thought they would have all been trying to get you to play basketball, right? And, well, I played basketball big... too, through, up through high school. And when you go to the University of Kansas, I know that's why. I mean, um, there's a little different world there. But I played basketball. It's a pretty funny story. I, so I go out for the University of Kansas basketball team because okay. I mean I. Played basketball every fall for yeah. since I was and a little you're kid. Tall, very tall. So I go out and do that, and then uh, it's the last year, year before the last year that they had freshman teams. So I thought, you know, I might be a hoot. I could make the maybe make the freshman team. That'd be kind of fun to fun to do. And sure. I had I had no visions beyond that. Um, so anyway, uh, Ted Owens was a coach at the time, and he pulls me aside after ten days, you know, practice. He goes, you know. Uh, I saw you play in high school, and I looked at him and I said, you didn't see me play in high school. You came to scout Pierre Russell in high school, and I happened to have to try to guard him. (laughs) He said, well, yes, that is correct. (laughs) Uh, He said, anyway, I want you to know that you'll probably, you could make this team as the, like, maybe the last guy. Do you know what that means? I said, not particularly, which you know is not good. He said, but he, he said, you know, I, I'd, I'd think that if you, and at the time I, I'm 6'5", and he, he says, if you could grow several inches in the next couple of weeks with your speed, we could use you. Or 
if you could get a lot faster in the next couple of weeks at your <laughs> height, we could use you. Otherwise, you might want to focus on your tennis game. <laughs> so I took that advice and yeah. played intramural basketball <laughs> and had a lot of fun. Actually played city league basketball until I was in my 40s. Up in oh, Phoenix. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you can play. You can hoop. Yeah. Used to be able to. <laughs> you don't play anymore? Yeah. Back, knees, you know. That's, no more tennis either? No. Nope, no. Nope. Yeah. And so, but when you go to college, what are you, what's your degree? What are you interested in? Well, you know, my dad's a businessman. It's kind of a standard thing. You right. go and you assume you're going to go into the business school. And right. uh, back then in a college, you you had the liberty of being a little more liberal artsy than now. Everything's so focused because mm-hmm. of the cost. Um, so I started off in the business school and, and I can still remember what happened. I mean, just this kind of wacky progression um, I was taking French and the business school people went at the end of like halfway through my sophomore year. So, well, you know, you can't take French anymore. You got to take business. And I, <laughs> I said, but what if I ended up in business in, in France? France? <laughs> and I said, well, maybe I don't want to go here. So then I, I took the second half of like econ 102 or whatever it was. And the, um, final was a hundred percent of the grade. Finals, the first day of finals, which was the day after the Big Eight tennis tournament. And I'm there on a tennis scholarship. Yes. So so I go into the professor and I said, you know, this is, and he goes, you GD athletes. I mean, I get it for a football player. A tennis player is not on this <laughs> some kind of a scope. And I said, no, I just kind of take the test early or whatever else, you know. Anyway, um, so I take this exam. And my roommate uh, was in the same class, took exactly the same test. So when it was over, we knew that he got an A, as he always did. Yeah. And, you know, I usually had A's or B's, but I thought, yeah, I got a pretty solid C on this. So I go down and, and see the grades posted, and I, it's posted with an F. And so I go in the office, and I said, can I see Professor, or whatever his name was? And they said, well, he's already gone to Canada for the summer. But, you know, don't worry because, you know, it's policy. They have to keep the test. And if they're, and that happens, there's mistakes. And, uh-huh. you know, so I put it behind me, go back in the fall, go in to see him. He said, I threw all those exams away. If it's an F, it's an F. Uh, I think he failed me because I was on a tennis scholarship. Oh, my God. But the good news is it th- it, I said, well, I'm done with a B school. <laughs> and then I was kind of a geography major. Then I was a math major. And then second semester of my senior year, um, I changed majors to art history. I took an art history course first semester, you know, the first semester of my senior year and just went, oh, so this is like everything I'm interested in rolled into one. And I remember I said to my dad, I, I said, I'm going to do this. He goes, is it really what you want to do? I said, yeah. He said, well, you realize what that means. Uh, you're going to start paying. You, you have to start paying for school. <laughs> uh, I said, yeah, I understand fully what it means. And, you know, because he had no, he had, he did not want you to go down that no, road. He didn't. You know, he said, if that's really what you want to do, go there. But, but you're going to pay you know, for just it. understand. Well, I'd, I'd had a full scholarship oh, for four years. Yeah. So I see. Sudden, things cost money now. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I, I did that and went on to graduate school and worked for a year at the University Art Museum as the registrar. And then I got a job as curator at the Phoenix Art Museum at the end of 1974. So now, before we go further, in that time frame, was this about 69 or... Yeah, I started, I was in graduate, I graduated high school in 67, so it would have been 71. So you got a deferment from Vietnam because of school? Yeah, I was uh, on a student deferment. um, And then I fell into the, uh, that moment where... If you were 1A, which I was, and not drafted by the end of February of 1971 or 2, whatever year that was, mm-hmm. uh, you made it, you know, you, you didn't end up not being drafted. And that's what happened to me. I fell into that gap. Yeah. So I was fortunate that I went on graduate school. Because that was a big deal right then. I mean, well, I can remember sitting in a fraternity house the, the night they did the first ball drop yeah, the and the lottery of, for the draft and you know I, we had a guy that was number one I mean it was yeah, he's you know, and it went on and on and on and I, I think my draft number was 50 so there wasn't much question of yeah you were going do. if you ever got out of school yeah so. did that affect the way you perceived what you needed to do in school knowing you were number 50 mm, not really I don't think I mean you're 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. It's kind of like this is the 
just deck like, that's dealt to you, yeah. so you just got to go. I mean, I, I was a not a fan of the Vietnam War, needless to say, and I participated in many anti-war protests. Yeah. And University of Kansas is a pretty um, activist school, which is probably surprised to a lot of people. Yeah, it surprises me, actually. Uh, but two of the years I was there, they closed the school. The school years closed early and finals weren't given because of riots on campus. And wow. No, it was serious business and SDS and all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, no. so, And you were in part, you were involved with that um, to some extent? Not in, I, I was involved with some protesting. Uh, I went to a friend of our family, actually, was our congressman. So um, I went to, with a group from the University of Kansas to his office in Washington to protest. <laughs> and I thought it'd be a real, you know, and, yeah, I can now understand how people do things and now they get nailed for some crazy thing they did. So I thought it was great because Congressman Wynn, who is a friend of ours, he would be okay if when he walked into his office, I was sitting on his desk. Oh. <laughs> Didn't go over quite as well as I thought it would. Uh, <laughs> you get arrested? No, no. But it was just kind of, you could just see him that. looking at me like, well, oh, man, what are you, what are you, of all people, what are you doing here? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, he had kids. His daughter was my age, and we'd gone through school together. And he had, she had an older brother who was my brother's age. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, yeah. th that's what you what you do. And one of the summers, mm -hmm. I um, ended up, I was teaching tennis for Johnson County. And um, they had a loyalty oath that you had to sign, which they didn't have people sign. And then ultimately as part of all this which to this day i certainly don't believe in loyalty oaths i refused to sign it um ended up on the front page of kansas city paper this uh -huh. you know and and then the <laughs> local tv station i'm out giving group tennis lessons at nolwood junior high school right. and this tv truck drives up and they and i go over and say can i help you and they was kind of milling around they said yeah we're looking for um, a guy named Ballinger, and they, I said, well, that's me. Why are you looking for me? And the guy looked at me and goes, oh. <laughs> and I said, what? He goes, well, we, we wanted a long-haired hippie, not some jock with a Princeton haircut. <laughs> <laughs> What's this deal that you're... And so I explained why I'd, I would not sign this oath. And one thing led me, it ended up on the front page of Kansas City Star, and my parents were not happy, particularly my mom was not happy about it because a lot of her friends were, you know, really after her. And uh, ultimately, uh, my parents received death threats. Wow. Um, and so ultimately, I thought, well, this got to stop. So I agreed to do it, but I, I said, all right, part of the reason I didn't do it was because on your own document, it says you have to sign this in front of a notary public. So my assumption is everyone working for the county for the summer did not sign and was not asked to sign in front of the notary. And they said, well, that'd be correct. I said, well, then I will sign and end this whole, I mean, it was crazy what was going on. How old were you when this was going on? I would have been 20 or 21. And, of course, the chairman of the parks board was another friend of my parents, uh, and he was not happy. Uh -uh. So, you know, about why is this guy doing all this stuff? So anyway, they had to give everyone the day off to go sign them right. So that was my, you know, <laughs> is, but again, you look back, I mean, it's the right thing to do, and I'd do it again today if, right. I, if he had to do it. But, I'm sure, uh, but yeah. those were times <laughs> where people were really engaged, as, yes. as you well know. And that would have been, it was probably about 69 or 70, right? Yeah, you know? 71, yeah. probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you, and when you took that course in art history, you think it was the professor that made the difference? or Absolutely. Was, yeah, he was just a great professor. Yeah, yeah, Jean Stump was, is really interesting. She came to art history late. Her husband was a really well-respected physicist and taught at the university, and she had taken art history late, and got her PhD, and it's interesting. She was kind of not admired by the rest of the faculty because she hadn't published a lot. Mm. But, um, you know, she's teaching intro to art history, and, I mean, she was just engaging, and everybody loved it, and you bam, bam, bam. It was her enthusiasm. And I remember, yeah, and I yeah. remember later. And, but, you know, you're looking at windows to the world, which yeah. is what, I mean, I had always looked at the syllabus as a Christmas present to, I had a very, by the time I finished school, I think you were supposed to have 100 and, 
24 hours to graduate. I had 160 some odd hours <laughs> and I still didn't have enough in any area for a degree. <laughs> and so, but I decided I wanted, you know, I wanted to go to graduate school and they pulled me into the office and they said, look, this woman said, you know, I don't know if you'd do this, but it'd really be cool if you would. There's a class that's offered next semester. If you take that class, you could have five majors. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'd really like to just go to graduate school. She said, okay, then just pick a major and we'll give it to you and get out of here and go, and go to graduate school. But it was, but I mean, you think about art and the history of art and the way it opens up to literally everything. Yes. So I'd been interested in geography, I'd been interested in history, I'd been interested in business, I'd been interested in mathematics. I, you know, took all kinds of wacky courses and it all kind of fed into that. And you're in this, if I had taken an art history class probably the first semester of my sophomore year, I bet I wouldn't have ended up in art history. And then I was fortunate enough that at the time, University of Kansas, had this incredible faculty for art history. I didn't know that. I mean, I just took this one <laughs> elective class. Stumps and, class. And there it goes, you know. And so that propelled you. Yeah, and then it turns out the faculty there was uh, Chu Tseng Lee, who taught um, Asian art history. I think the last I remember, uh, he had trained 27 curators. Wow. Uh, in Chinese art. Including Claudia Brown, at, uh, who's now at ASU, and Janet Baker, who's at, at uh, the Phoenix Art Museum. And, you know, there weren't many places where you could have that. Charles Eldridge was just starting his career as an American art historian. I was one of five in his first classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he went on to be the director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and then came back to Kansas as a hall. Uh, professor and then Marilyn Stockstad, you know, for people who are art history students, everybody at a certain age or up took Jan, you know, Jansen was the textbook. Well, eventually Jansen was superseded by Stockstad. Mm. So those are my three primary people, I mean, who are connected. And Eldridge, uh, there's probably 20 some odd curators. Betsy Brune, who was director of the Smithsonian, was uh, one of his students. And I mean, it just kind of on and on. So, and that's, it was a lively time, a mm-hmm. lively moment. And you're around people that are engaging and they gave um, f- students, I mean, like, you know, like opportunities that are kind of hard today. At one point, I signed up for a seminar that was to go through the WPA print collection Mm -hmm. that had been given to the university. Nobody ever cared about them. So you give it to four graduate students to figure out what the hell these things are and do a small show and write the labels Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I'm still all these years later, as you know, (laughs) looking at new deal (laughs) art things. So, uh, you know, it has, has a real impact in the exhibitions. The University of Kansas had a superb uh, university art collection, and it had been, um, you know, run by people. One of the earlier directors went on to be the director of Chicago Art Institute. Marilyn Stockstad had done that. Eldridge had done it. Another guy went on to run the Seattle Art Museum. I mean, wow. uh, Another guy so went on to was, run the Phoenix Art yeah, Museum. Yeah, so there was really, <laughs> uh, yeah, really good people ended up, coming through there which uh-huh. you know and, and so where did you go to graduate school there yeah you just stayed there and went to graduate yeah, school yeah i got my master's degree and back back in the day uh to then jump into museum world you didn't have to have a phd uh-huh. the way you would today right um just you know that's the difference between then and and now and at one point i'd been curator in phoenix for i'll say five years maybe and um, and that was your first job, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I okay. got one job and retired from there. How, it's that, unbelievable. That, that doesn't happen nah, anymore. That never but and it wouldn't happen again. But um, the interesting thing was at the time, University of Delaware was kind of the the hotbed for training American art history students. And um, a couple of people there, Wayne Craven, and uh, said tried to get me to come back there to go to school. I thought, well, maybe I should do that, go back and get my PhD, because then later in life, you know, you got more flexibility, et cetera, right. et cetera. 
it's funny how the real world gets in the middle of things. So and, clear, I did, and clearly you like school. <laughs> yeah, and so I went I, I went back. They asked me to come back. I went to uh, back to Delaware, went on campus. It, it was really terrific, and I decided that was the thing to do. And I said, you know, if you do that, I'm gonna, I need like a TA thing or something like that from a cost point of view because I'd be giving up a paying job, which by then I was probably making eleven or twelve thousand dollars a year <laughs> um and then um they said well we can't do that because there's people already here that are kind of in line for those but year two maybe so i thought okay so i have a paying job dealing with real art that i have travel capabilities to organize shows go to to museums and look at real art and I can give that up to go sit in a dark room and look at slides of art <laughs> for two years and then come out and compete for a job that I don't know if it's going to be a place I like and <laughs> and I thought well, there's something wrong with this picture yeah. so I said heck with it I'll stay and so for several years because of the way Phoenix was at the time a lot of interest in Western American art and Western American art was not taught I had to teach myself all that. So I basically did shows every year, different segments, and discovered a lot of the people you show and all. Yeah. And back they were lost souls at those times. So it was pretty um, heady. And I could, you know, I'd, I could go spend a week at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston going through their vaults. I right. mean, you can't do that if you're a PhD student. <laughs> I mean, you can get an appointment to go in right. for an hour. But, you know, like I went back, the Carolick collection there, I'm, I'm going to give away a couple secrets here probably, but uh, at the time, and I think it's still true today, the American collection in Boston is like unbelievable. And much of it is the uh, Carolick collection. The Carolick collection, if I remember right, had two volumes for their paintings and two, or th and two volumes for their watercolor and drawing collection. Well, I was doing a show at one point, and I went back and I was working, and I was looking at um, Thomas Moran drawings, which, you know, not bad. They mm -hmm. hand you a box of Thomas <laughs> Moran drawings. And I'm looking through them, and I'd already gone through the books to say, you know, there's this one and this one and this one and this one I'm interested in. I want to see them. They said, well, here's the two or three boxes. And I started going through. I said, this isn't in the book, and this one isn't in the book. And they said, well, oh, no, the coll whole collection's not in the book. I mean, these books are like <laughs> this thick and there's more. with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of watercolors and drawings. They said, oh, no, only half the collection's oh catalog. Yeah. They said every artist included is in the book, but only half the artworks are. I mean, it was like, whoa. <laughs> and it's all great stuff. It, well, the collection was, was just spectacular. So... Um, and I probably that's more art history learning than. So you went through the entire collection. Well, yeah, and we, we did that, and then uh, later on, uh, Fred you, Meyer, when he was director of the Gilcrease, which is in, has they ended up with the Moran Studio. They had yes. twelve hundred Moran. <laughs> uh, and they had a no lend policy, and they changed the policy um, to do a Moran show at the Phoenix Art Museum because Fred and I were close, and he'd been so he used me as excuse to try to change this around a little bit. Um, and we went through that that collection. Uh, it's just staggering. And there's, I mean, I can still remember there's art history moments when the hair comes up on your neck. Right. So. I'm back there for days looking through all these this Morans. This is the Gilcrease, right? At the Gilcrease to do a Moran show from these 1,200. 1,200 sounds amazing, but they he did a lot of etchings. They had things where they had 30 of the same etchings, so, but you know, it was still a whole lot of, of material. Right. And there's the, the greatest painting of Arizona ever, Arizona landscape certainly, is probably Chasm of the Colorado by Moran, was done you know, as a result of the Powell surveys in 1872 and three uh, in his Washington studio. Well, there was always the rumor that because he worked in pieces, there was really no preliminary sketch for it. Um, and that's kind of what scholars thought. Well, I, there's this manila envelope, I pull this piece of paper out, it's a folded in quadrants 
watercolor. <laughs> and I open it and I open it. And basically, there's the storm of Chasm of the Colorado. So the, the piece that had no preliminary sketches wow. uh, is pretty much the paintings laid out there. And your hair went on the back well, of your neck. Well, you just go, was, man, is that cool? No one and knows then, this. Yeah, it's wonderful. And then and that there's happened. another. Then there was another little envelope in a file because they they never showed these things in all these years. Right. I mean, uh, that I, I opened it up and there's a little. Oh, it might be size of an index card or maybe smaller. You know, a three uh -huh. by five card, and it's uh, Green River. You know that rock formation yep. on the Green River, of a w little watercolor. Yep. You, and on the back, and his hand is my first painting in the West. Oh my! <laughs> oh. So, uh, and you know those things. They did were, you were shown in art history courses. Did you show that in? Yeah, they the were. Show. They were in that show. We did and, that, a, and you were the cat. curator at that time. That yeah, you, yeah, I was curator when I went to Phoenix at, in the end of '74. I was curator to Lady Two. And then became director in '83. So I was director for 33 years. And what were some of the shows that you did? You did a Moran show, clearly. Um, well, back in the day of trying to work toward Western American art, particularly, uh, we we did a show, um, one that a lot of people still remember. Interesting, it was called "Beyond the Endless River," and it was watercolors and drawings in 19th century West. That's mm. when I ran in, went into the museum. Fine Arts Boston was mm -hmm. doing all that kind of stuff. So we did that show. We did a big Peter Hurd show, a Thomas Moran show, Frederick Remington show, Charlie Russell shows, um, Taos exhibition. We showed the Idle George collection before there was an Idle George. Wow. Worked with Rudy Wonderlick a lot at uh, the gallery in New York. Um, and you were working on, right before you were made, the director a big show on Dixon, right? Yeah, yeah, I had met, um, I forget how I came across Dixon originally, but I, you know, I saw works and the Phoenix Art Museum had two zingers, yes. you know, watchers from the rooftops and for the 1946 desert paint, rat. Yeah, Home of the Desert Rat, um, which I liked a great deal. And he was very modernist in his approach. Um, and it's kind of like every time I saw it, painting by Maynard Dixon was really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just a lot of artists aren't that consistent. Um, so I ended up um, contacting Edith Hamlin, his widow, and went up and visited her and to ask if there'd ever been a really ma major show. And she said, really not. There'd been exhibitions and there'd been things that were retrospective, but they're usually kind of more casually put together than really seriously right. put together. So I said to her, what do you say we do a show? She said, I'm, I'm in. So um, I was, you know, kind of working on that when uh, my predecessor, Ron Hickman, um, resigned somewhat abruptly. And next thing I knew, I'm acting director of the museum, right. and I didn't really want to be a director, and so there's a year of search, so I take a hiatus, and ultimately ended up becoming the director, and then I could never go back to undertaking a big project. I mean, I thought, oh, we'll get back, because she would come to Phoenix, because there's the great Dixon mural, and one of her murals, actually, at the Biltmore Hotel, and, and every two years, she'd come for a week as a guest of the hotel, and she'd touch things up, and mm -hmm. so we'd get together. So, I mean, there was this kind of ongoing relationship, but it never got back to that. So it's been really gratifying to me to see all the rise in Maynard Dixon, because he certainly is an artist, um, you know, along with Remington, who's kind of a generation earlier, I think, are just incredibly important I mean, figures dealing with the American West. And and Dixon's more modernist. I mean, he dealt with yeah, um, sure. some of the uh, labor issues and just his style's more modernist. So. Yeah. Um, Not as and he's, the, and he's an inspiration to a lot of artists still painting today. Yeah. So that's really neat to see. So and now we have kudos a... to you for <laughs> what you've done with Dixon over the years. You're you're, you're more you're more fixated than I was. <laughs> yeah, but the fact is, you were trying to get it done early on for Phoenix, and now, of course, Scottsdale yeah. Museum of the West finally has done it. Yeah, and it's taken 
and it's, years, and I it's guess. great to, to see that and the publications that have been around him and the continual discovery yeah. uh, around an artist like that who was also a pretty darn good poet. And, yeah. Um, pretty cool to see. I mean, you th- and you think Remington, he, there was an interchange, forget exactly how it went, between Dixon as an early young artist sent things to Remington yeah. for... 1891. Yeah, mm-hmm. for his reactions and all. And Remington um, was, a. I, I think, the one thing he is is one of the greatest sculptors in the 19th century, and he doesn't get his due for that. But also a superb artist. But Remington also was a pretty good writer, you know, and he figured out he was a great businessman as an artist, and he figured out that, oh... If I'm writing for Harper's Weekly and I get paid 50 bucks to write the article, if I do the illustration, I get the 50, I'm making the numbers up, but the $50 to be do the illustration. Well, in those days, then when the illustrator sent them in, the magazine just pitched them when they right. were finished doing the halftones. He didn't do that. He was, I think, if not the first, one of the very first artists to say, no, I'm giving to, but I want my stuff back. Right. And then he would sell it. So he figured out on one assignment how to get paid three times. Um, and his goal was to be rich and famous as an artist, yeah. and he, he achieved that. He when he deserve. died in 1909, I mean, the numbers sound weaselly, but if you look at it as a lifestyle thing, the year before he died, he bought a five-acre estate in Ridgefield, Connecticut with a tennis court. I think it had a swimming pool. He w- was a, and, there, and then he built a huge studio. So they bought and a big mansion. So I bought the house, paid for all the furnishings, um, and that was his. And that amount of money was his average yearly income as an artist. Wow! Yeah. So I mean, it, yeah. if you think about whatever your dream home is, right? And the, that's 1908. Yeah, and but that's I mean, a year after. A major bank failure. Yeah, so, yeah. 1909, he died. Yeah, and 1907, uh, dramatically from yeah, appendicitis, uh, appendicitis yeah. and he had, they had to do an appendectomy on his kitchen table. Yeah, <laughs> which hadn't been around all that long. No, really no. Well, it years. was a real uh, major killer of Americans at that time. Yeah. yeah, so wasn't that odd? But they, because he was as as uh, Linda and I refer to him as Fat Fred, because he was like. Five nine, five ten, and weighed close to three hundred pounds. Yeah. But he was also very athletic and all this kind of stuff. But because of his girth, they started trying to move him to a hospital in a wagon. They and it, they couldn't, so they had to operate yeah. there. And then peritonitis. Set yeah, him. and it's but, very hard to. But get ironically, through. he died at a very good time. And I think uh, as a young man, at age forty nine. Yeah. Um, the art world was ready to pass him by. And we think of the Armory Show right behind that, modernism right. coming in. Uh, he couldn't have made that transition. So in a way, he picked career-wise, <laughs> market-wise, <laughs> in the future, he picked a good way to, a good way uh-huh. to go. He really you know, went out at the height of his powers. But Yeah, that is true. I never considered that, but it would have changed. But I mean, it is ironic. Yeah, I mean, you read about... You know, for, with Dixon especially, I'm reading some of the things, letters back and forth in 1931, and you know, modernism was just r- rolling over yeah. everything. Yeah. They're trying to figure out how do they deal with it. He was as an artist, yeah. as, well, as was his gallerist, was trying to figure out what trying to yeah. figure out what do we do. Yeah. So it's not that long yeah. from that time frame. Plus, he avoided World War One and 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 all the right. devastation that right. would have come with that and the other things too. So, so you did, so you were going to do Dix and you didn't, but then you take the position of the director and you're young then. You, how old are you? Yeah. At that time I'm 31. Well, that's really young. And, and we have younger directors today, uh, which is a good thing, I think. But I remember I, the year after I became director of the museum, you know, I joined the uh, American Association of Art Museum Directors. So I go to my first meeting <laughs> in L.A. At the, and it's hosted at the L.A. County and all this. And I go and I, I probably out of at that time there might have been seventy-five member directors, and it was like going to a meeting of dads. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it was. There, the the actually there were there were three new directors that year: Ann Donnancourt, who became director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, ultimately. 
Um, Peter Marzio ended up at Houston and me. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the three. And uh, so I show up uh, there from major museums as curators. I mean, I'm, nobody's ever seen this wet behind the ear guy I was. And I just remember I went up and the, they had a reception and everybody's tuned in. I don't know a soul. So I I just go in the gallery and go Start look. Looking at, at the, there was a show of old master <laughs> drawings up and I'm kind of looking at the drawings and still wondering, you know, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I literally, you know, you can, you're, I was going one way and this other, and I bump into somebody and look around and it's uh, Carter Brown, who's director of the... National Gallery and kind of the you know the right. hero of art museums and I look at him and um, and he looked at me and said oh you're a new guy I said yeah and he introduced himself and I introduced myself he said well you need to meet people so he says come with me uh -huh. so yeah. he he went down and introduced me to folks and, wow you know but it was you know, that pretty was, gratifying. was that eighty or eighty one that would have been in eighty. Probably two, 82. 82. And interestingly, his family, you know, which is Brown University and goes all the way back, they owned a ranch in Arizona. Mm. And when the Phoenix Art Museum hit our 25th anniversary, I was trying to come up with some way to celebrate it. And I knew that Carter came out every year to kind of, as he said, to make sure the ranch is still right, there. Right. Um, so I invited him to come and we were having a big, you know, to do event and said, would you come out? He said, no, I don't do those things. I don't come and I don't want to give a talk, I mean, that, right. that kind of thing. And I said, well, I didn't ask you to give a talk. I just asked you to come. Yeah. I said, if you would, would you be willing to come and just offer a toast to our next 25 years? It's all I'm you know, right. and then you, we'll put you up at the Biltmore <laughs> and, and for a couple of days, and, and then you can go on down to, you know, where the ranch is. So, you know, he, he agreed to do it, um, which, was, which was great. And he was a guy that was just incredibly supportive of the field, of all museums, mm. was able to always say the right thing at the right time. I mean, just people love Carter Brown. He was a mentor, you think, to you? Well, not a mentor. He's kind of a mentor to everybody in the yeah. field because he's just so good. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, he stands up and, you know, gives this toast and then adds how fortunate the museum is to have such an up-and-coming, great, you know, young director, <laughs> and all, which I didn't ask him to say. No, but, I'm sure not. Uh, but, you know, he just... Did the right thing. I mean, it's yeah. it's easy to model. So it's not mentoring. You model yourself in any field yes. over people you respect. Yeah. And you may not even know some of the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, you know what you know and what you see. And he did it. Yeah, but he was he was one of those special people. And so the museum. How old was the museum when you took it over? Uh, well, it opened in fifty nine, so it would have been. And you took it over in eighty. Yeah. So twenty. Yeah, so young. It was a young museum. Yeah, yeah. And it's a it's a privately owned museum, right? Yeah. The, well, I look at it this way. This year is the 60th anniversary of the Phoenix Art Museum, and I was there for two thirds of that time. Wow. Yeah. So. And the growth in that museum, from when you took it over mm -hmm. to when you left. Yeah. It, when I started at the museum, right? Mark, we had I joined a staff of 16. I made the 17th. Some of those were part time. Right. Uh, if I remember right, we had a budget of three hundred and something thousand dollars a year. Uh, when I retired, we had a staff of one hundred and fifty with a budget of twelve million dollars wow. a year. Wow! And the facility itself went from seventy two thousand seventy yeah seventy two thousand to almost three hundred thousand square feet. Wow! So, Huge. Yeah, a lot jobs. of a lot of effort. A lot of people worked hard. A lot of terrific trustees, volunteers, great staff members. You know. And at the time you took it over, would you have said it was primarily focused on Western art at that time? Is that a true statement? No, it it's kind of interesting. Uh, when it got started, the in '59 it opened, with, and the idea was you got to have European art because that's capital A art. Right. Um, so it was mostly European, some contemporary things, and some interest in regional art. And there was a lot of Western art collectors. 
Um, it was never stated to me, but it was very clear after I arrived. When I, when I was hired, we had a director, Ron Hickman, who was um, a contemporary art person and uh, had been a nationally recognized jeweler. He was a great metalsmith. Um, and he loved Mexican art. He was, uh, I don't know how he got involved. He'd been at the San Diego Museum. Mm -hmm. and anyway, he, so he was doing that. And there was interest in Mexico because, you know, it's right here. Right. Um, and then Bob Frankel was the assistant director. And, and his background had been at NYU at the Institute. And his background was European art. And so he did that. And, you know, my background was American art. And I was this rookie curator. Well, when I showed up, I realized what was going on was that there was a lot of friction in the community. A lot of people wanted more for Western art. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got professional staff that it's not their field. It's, well, it's nobody's field from a scholarship point mm -hmm. of view, really, at that point. But so the, um, it, it was clear that that's why they wanted to add somebody like me there, and they didn't have any money, so you had to hire somebody <laughs> that's a right. total rookie with no experience. And I, I still remember my beginning salary of $9,100. <laughs> uh, the... Um, you know, and then it kind of moved forward from there. But it was clear to me that you had collectors like Reed Mullen, who also owned Mullen Ford, and he ran an art gallery out of the back of the Ford dealership mm -hmm. with historic Western American art. Um, and Thelma Keekeffer was involved, a lot of ranching families, mm -hmm. and they had had things. So there was a lot of interest in Western art. And there was, as I say, the kind of this friction a few years um, prior to that, in 69, which is before I showed up, they had a, a Friends of Art organization, and every year they bought a work of art. Well, in 1969, they bought um, the George O'Keefe painting the museum has called Pink Abstraction, mm -hmm. which is just yeah knockout picture yeah, of 1929. Beautiful. Well, I guess that's, that became the boiling point because people were upset who were Western art folks. Why didn't you buy a New Mexico painting versus a Lake George painting? And so it got so hot that the um, Friends of Art dissolved. And out of that, uh, the Western group created the Western Art Associates, which I think was the first Western support group of a museum. Um, and the Arizona Costume Institute started about the same time um, for fashion design at the museum. And we had Friends of Mexican Art was a, not part of the museum, but it was part of the community. So those were kind of the three driving forces. And back then, Western art was pretty affordable. I mean, as, we, as I started learning the field, right. you found things you could, you know, I mean, now I just... Yeah. I think, oh my gosh, why didn't we go borrow money or something? I know, and you, had great, and you have great pieces. Yeah, and we bought some great, great things along the way with Western Art Associates, who ultimately, you know, they disbanded a couple of years ago after their 50th anniversary. But when you looked at their list of acquisitions over 50 years, it was just staggering. I mean, what, what, what do you, they did. Why do you think they disbanded? Um, the museum, after I retired, the uh, incoming director and the board decided they wanted to not involve these ancillary organizations as much as they want. I mean, I, I don't know specifically what happened, but um, we had several of them, and they ended up, I think there's only three now, that mm. they, they were disbanded. Um, you know, I mean, it's... It was a great run, what they 50 did. 50 years. Yeah. That's but, I mean, like, the I can, I can remember the E. Martin Hennings painting that we bought, yeah, which is... My favorite painting. I, it's got to be, if it's not the best painting he ever made, it's one of the best two or three paintings we can argue it's about, a, that kind of stuff. I think it's the best one he ever made. Yeah. So, and that painting, it was one of these moments. Uh, Denny Lyon, who just recently passed away, was involved with Western Art Associates. Well, he was in Santa Fe. There was a... Uh, Henning's exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts. He called me up and said, get over here. There's a painting <clears throat> that's just is, it'll blow your brains out. We gotta, we gotta see this thing. And um, the rumor is it's for sale. Mm. So we saw the painting 
uh, it did blow your brains right. out. Uh, and yes, turned out it was for sale. And it was for sale from a family, a farm family in Illinois, who owned one painting, that picture. Wow. <laughs> and the painting had been purchased by their parents, I think, I, either on their honeymoon or a trip to New Mexico. Uh -huh. um, and they owned this painting. And at that point, the farm economy was, you know, in trouble. And so, and Danny said, you know, I'm on the board. I Ethically, I can't buy this picture. Right. <laughs> so we got to figure out how to do it. So we ended up paying a record price for it. Uh, and along the way, the family, as it got discovered by two or three of the major dealers at the time, and I don't remember the year of this, sadly, but... Um, they started offering a whole lot more money than we had agreed to. And the family said, no, we, we made an agreement with the wow, Phoenix Art Museum them. and um, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to budge from that. We're actually happy that it's going to an institution. Yeah. And we made a, Me too. we had an early on, um, I mean, it's before G. Clay probably, but we did a reproduction of it and had it framed and gave it to them for their house on the farm. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was... I think it's my favorite painting it, in the museum. Yeah, and honestly. it really broke the museum open mm -hmm. with regard to Western American art because before that, as curator, I, I kept getting frustrated because I'd see, you know, XYZ painting and it'd be, you know, let's say $65,000. Well, all these folks are going, well, wait a minute, I remember when those were $27,000. Right. You know? So it was like they couldn't do that, couldn't do that. Well, here here comes a painting and it was four hundred and twenty thousand yeah. dollars, if I remember correctly, um, and it was co-owned by two dealers. Um, we traded out some duplicate Laverne Nelson Black paintings for the commission to them, and paid the uh, to the family. And, and here's the capper. Now, imagine if this were today. Oh yeah. So we were. I forget, $75,000 short on the cash side. So Don Tostenrud, who ran the Arizona Bank in, in, in Tucson years ago, and then when the headquarters were in Phoenix, he became chairman. He was uh, on Western Art Associates. He was on our board of trustees. And he goes, oh, the, the bank will just lend you the money. <laughs> 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 so... Arizona Bank lends us whatever the I think it was sixty five thousand dollars and said, you know, you got to pay it off in eight months or something. Right. And it's an interest free loan. <laughs> now, that would never yeah. happen. Never. Yeah. It couldn't even probably legally happen today. So we did this big fundraiser and they raised it in like six weeks and paid yeah. it off. But I mean, it was just that kind of spirit in the community yeah. that made it exciting to be there when you're formative years. I mean, there's mountains to be climbed. You climb them. And everybody's helping drag you to the top of the yeah. mountain because it's good for the community. And then we added to get real involved with Asian art after that with because of a couple of collections that came to us. And we got more involved with Latin American art and more involved with contemporary art. And, and then you did the Cowboy uh, yeah, Artists the, and of the, America for yeah, many years, right? The Cowboy Artists Show, everybody says, oh, that you know, the Phoenix Art Museum. But I was actually started at the Cowboy Hall of Fame right. in 60, I'll say 68 or 69, something like that. And um, after four or five years, there was a, a some kind of a blow up between the organization and the museum in Oklahoma. Uh, Thelma Kiekeffer, who was on the board of the Phoenix Art Museum and real involved with the Western American art, was also on the board of the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Um, so she knew that was happening and she said, well, why don't you move to the Phoenix Art Museum, which is, you know, still ranching. That was still a big part of mm -hmm. the character of our communities, which isn't lost today. Right. But it used to be when I first came here, every doctor's office, every bank lobby was all Western, mm -hmm. all Western American art and decor. And, you know, so those, and, you know, we've evolved beyond that. Um, but so she wanted it to be moved uh, out. And she said, we have this beginning group, the Men's Arts Council, 
it'll give them something to do. It'll give those young men something to do at the <laughs> Phoenix Art Museum. Well, so they took it on to run it. Uh-huh. And so they took the load off the staff because it's, and, and they were hugely successful. Yeah, when did that start? Hugely, what did so that start? the first year at the Phoenix Art Museum was in 1973. Oh, yeah. Uh, I forget the last year, but it was 30 some odd years yes. that it was there. I mean, I there were crazy scenes at that. I remember one night when the before we expanded, we had fifteen hundred people at the opening, and the gallery capacity was not fifteen hundred. I can tell you <laughs> that. I mean, no matter what we did, I mean, there were people were sweating and complaining it was yes. too hot. And yeah. I'm going, well, what do you expect? It's ninety eight point <laughs> six degrees in here. Right. But, you know, and so, and the timing <laughs> turned out to be really good when the market for cowboy artists, of, you know, that style and who right. they were at the time, you know, they were a big deal. And then um, they were, in fact, so successful and the other shows started and more galleries got involved. And, right. You know. And it probably it really affected Scottsdale itself with all, downtown. Well, Scottsdale Old had Main. some marvelous galleries yes. and they were involved and, you know, we did joint projects with them and, you know, there was some, some friendly fire because the galleries were trying to show things because the buyers are in town and they right. had an agreement not to show anything. And it was like, yeah, it was, it was terrific. I, after I realized what was going on, I mean, I knew I couldn't do anything about it, but I just, I found joy. <laughs> and sometimes uh-huh. little things get you excited. So every uh, day on Friday before the show would open, I'd go out to the Scottsdale Galleries, which we had an agreement that they would not show or sell any work of art by the CA artist until after the sale. Right. And you could see them all in the back room and there's people in the back room it's like a wink wink kind yeah. of deal and i'd go in and say oh how are things going you know and everybody kind of stumble around and i mean i wasn't trying to do anything yeah. other than have some fun but it was uh, uh, but it was really great for their um for the scottsdale gallery scene when it was really going and ultimately right. they got some really good contemporary galleries going and you know those days are gone now but yeah why do you think those days are gone um, well, the internet's a big part of it. Um, I think also that um, there was a moment where people were only interested in really blue chip contemporary stuff, and um, you know you just can't hold that hold that together in a whole gallery scene. Western art's not as popular as it was mm-hmm. uh, i mean there are still great places such as you know your gallery with with wonderful material but as you well know i mean they, you don't have young buyers filling in the shoes no, of we're, we're working on that yeah, that's exactly yeah, everybody's right. working on it um but you know i mean and that and anything that's style derived goes in and out i mean did you ever think 20 years ago that everybody who had to have it would have to have an early modern house, no. you know, a mid-century modern right. house, mid-century modern furniture, <laughs> mid-century this, mid-century that. <laughs> right. But I mean, so all of a sudden right now, yeah. I mean, Palm Springs, Phoenix, uh, here in well, Tucson, modernism weeks, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of young people. So you see a lot of knockoffs. Um, well, you, you know, Mike Haskell. Yeah who has a marvelous, I mean, talk about a, a when he has a Spanish colonial dealer, yeah. is there anybody better? I know. I, I, I did a know. podcast with him, actually. Yeah, and he has a marvelous gallery over in, you know, Santa Barbara, Montecito. And his son, who was, a, I think it was an art history major, if I remember right, got involved with that. But his son now is selling yeah. mid-century modern, yeah. and they've also made deals in Mexico uh, to make... Uh, really marvelous reproduction Spanish colonial furniture because right. harder to get Spanish colonial well Mike is like uh, he'd <laughs> smile if I said that he's becoming a little bit of a curmudgeon about all this because he's frustrated and we have a daughter in, in Santa Barbara too now actually and we go over there and I go visit and he just says you know we don't we don't have the people coming in that care, that I, that was enjoyable yeah. to talk with and learn from and all that kind of stuff. And he said so many people, particularly because of the economic success in California now, send their designer over who comes in and they're looking for a painting that fits whatever their vision is. And, and he said, frankly, so many of them don't really care whether it's a reproduction or the real yeah, thing. And he goes, you know, that had 
that's a punch to your solar plexus. Yeah. And, and, and he said, it is to mine too, but that is, uh, you know, and those days will come back. I mean, I remember when 17th, 18th century paintings were being deaccessioned like mad out of museum collections only to find 20 years later they're trying to buy back what they, they deaccessioned, right, so yeah. to speak. Um, so I think museums still do these, but they're much more judicious about it so they don't make those kind of mistakes. Well, I think it's interesting, at least in Scottsdale, you have the Scott, uh, Scottsdale Museum of the West now this, yeah. that, that Scottsdale's actually put up the money, I don't know, like $44 million or something. And uh, how do you think that may affect that market? It seems like they're really, I mean, they've got the Sticks and Show they're doing, and they had a Taos show before that, and they seem to really be trying to put together some major shows and bring yeah. the emphasis just to Western and Native arts. Yeah. Well, I think the, you know, I hate to say it, but I, I think it'll, it's going to be 10 years off before you know what the answer to your real yeah. answer to well, your question right. is. I think you're probably right. Um, because, you know, it's hard <clears throat> when you're breaking into a new place um, philanthropically, they're dependent on gifts and attendance is tougher because what we're just talking about among younger audience. Uh, people aren't as interested in older things. Like, uh, in the antique world, it's now referred to as brown furniture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and 19th century American art, unless it's uh, A++++, really hard to move. So everything's pretty contemporary driven. So it's, the question is, how do you make, whether it's the Phoenix Art Museum, the Tucson Museum of Art, the Scottsdale Museum of Western Art, how do you make that material relevant to the to various audiences? And, you know, and you represent some of these folks, but I can remember trying to get our Western group to try to buy art that I'd say depicts the new West. Mm-hmm. It was next to impossible. And what the, what a really funny experience was... <clears throat> we were, I had a group of our Western art as a museum trip in Santa Fe uh, at Gerald Peters Gallery. There was a show up by an artist from Colorado named Chuck Forsman. Mm-hmm. I know exactly who it is. Who uh, I had not known his work. I knew his name. The, he had gone to mm-hmm. ASU, believe it or not, so I'd seen a painting or two of his, but I, I didn't re- really register but this exhibition was powerful, and it was about kind of man's interference with the West. I mean, it was subtle, but it was in there. It wasn't just pretty picture stuff. And there was one painting in particular that I thought we should have. So I suggested to the Western Art Group, who, of course, had paid $420,000 for a Hennings, right. that we should spring for $12,500 for this Chuck Forsman landscape painting that was probably four to five feet wide, maybe three feet tall. Um, no, no, we can't, we can't do that. And I, I told uh, Jerry Peters, I said, can we put that on painting on hold? He said, yes, because, you know, he wanted to sell to a museum sure, and, of course. and all that kind of stuff. And we had done business, and <clears throat> so he was happy to do that. So it was on hold for, I think it was a year, maybe even over a year, and a couple times he called him and said, Jim, I'll just give you the painting. <laughs> I said, no, we've got to, I've got to continue to make the case that, the, that museums today should be collecting this material because I contend, and back then it was year 2000 maybe or something, that if you're in 2050 and the question is what was life like in the West at the turn of the century, it's not going to be the CA artist as fine of illustrative work as they made, but they were very nostalgic and they were almost like history painters. That it's going to be these artists or Ed Mel or, right. uh, you know, we could go. Howard Post. Yeah, Howard Post, uh, Smith up in Utah. I mean, so can you just hang? I'm doing, a, you know, it's not like you're doing battle day to day because you've got a lot of other things to do. But ultimately, we wore them down. And it led to, again, just like when we bought the Hennings, it, it led to spending serious dollars on, I mean, then we bought the Ufer. I mean, it just went bam, bam, bam. Right. We, we were able to, 
and, and the confidence that you could raise the money and, and do it, this was now that we opened that door, there was an opening to make acquisitions like that. So, um, you know, we did that. And I think a museum's got to be changing with its times and reflective of that. Um, like there's a lot of interest now in all of our museums in Latin American art. It's a really healthy, mm -hmm. good, good thing. And we were, we were growing along those lines too. And now it's really ramped up. And, and I mean, it was, I bet 15 years ago, there wasn't 10 curators of Latin American art in America. Wow. I mean, I, Hard to I may be that. off on some numbers, yeah. but you get the, the, the idea now, you know, Phoenix has one, Tucson. I mean, right. L.A. County. Every not everybody, but still, it's it's not that unique. Well, when I first started in museums, Western American art, you didn't. You, you had certain museums in the West that were dedicated to these regional artists, but on a scale of Western art being part of the American art scene, not so much. Yeah. I mean, we were we were kind of on the edge of that and, and i've seen the same with mexican art now you've, mm -hmm. with here in our area and then you've seen the same with latin american art uh, a lot in the east and i think there's kind of to me there's two latin american arts um the art world in the east coast you know new york centric mm -hmm. they go due south right they hit brazil yeah so they to them Cuba, it's uh, but if you're on on our side of the country and you go due south, you have Mexico and Central America. Yes. So, you know, it's a natural give and take. Uh, and then you have the battle of East Coast versus West Coast as to <laughs> who's, who's right. Better, but, right. you know, the, the real answer is you ought to be doing both. Right. But when you back in the day, you had everybody's traveling back and forth to Mexico. So there was a natural interest there. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's pretty gratifying to see all this so, growth and continued growth. So... You did that for, almost, well, you were with them for 40 years. Yeah, I retired in 2015. And now you're working on some other things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, I, I, I retired, and, and people said, what are you going to do when you retire? So, you know, I, I don't really have a plan. I think some people do. I mean, I have a lot of interests, and I figured things would take care of themselves, and, and it's kind of turned out that way. I've ended up... Um, technically on the staff of two different art museums or uh -huh. two different museums since then. I went back to um, Connecticut. Um, Tom Lohman, who'd been curator of European art at the Phoenix Art Museum, became director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum, which is the, they talk about the opposite of Phoenix. It is the oldest operating public art museum in America. It was wow. opened in 1844. Wow. And they still have part of their original building. <laughs> and their collection is spectacular. I mean, not many places you go have 13 church paintings or wow. 20 <laughs> Thomas Cole paintings. Wow. Uh, yeah. Frederick Edwin Church lived maybe 250 yards from the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it was a real different experience. But he, he inherited that job, and as quite often happens, they're – from a person who'd been there, they'd finished a big capital drive. People had moved on to other things, and he called me up. And he said, could you come back and help a week, a month, or something while I write the ship here? The, uh, they were down to American curators. They, were, um, they had no development department. The, it just, and they had three, I think it was three 35-year employee department heads who had slated retirements. He said, I, I don't want to be in a position that I um, don't put good people in there. So he said, if you, and I said, well, but why me? you got people like me that are back east and you don't have all this. He says, no, and of course, part of this is recruitment. He says, no, you're the only person that can do that. And I said, well, I'm flattered, but you know, I don't, I don't buy that. <laughs> But he said, actually, two or three things. He said, you know, you've done all these jobs. I need somebody who can keep the momentum going so you understand all that. We're down American curators. Your field's American art history. Um, and if you can just do that. And, and he said, furthermore, when you bring somebody in, you know, the board is going to get concerned over credentials. And he goes, you know, you've been president of the Association of Art Museum Directors. You were 
a presidential appointment to the National Arts Council. So the board can't complain about your qualities. And I said, yeah, and there's another quality I have you need. And he said, what's that? I said, I'm old. And he goes, well, no, no, Jim, you're, you're not old. I said, well, I don't mean old in, in that way necessarily, but it's real clear that if I came back there, I'm not trying out for one of these right. jobs. So I'm not competitive to anybody else. So I went and did that for about, it was supposed to be six months, and we did 10 months. It was terrific uh, and a great experience. And then... Uh, more recently, the um, head of the Science Center in Phoenix, when the economy crashed in 08, they took on stewardship of a history museum in Phoenix that had been around since the 20s. It's kind of like a community attic. It, mm-hmm. It's not the um, at the level of the historical society, but you know some interesting things that were related uh, to all kinds of aspects of Phoenix in central Arizona history. Um, and they're, uh, as a science center, they're, they don't collect. They're an experienced place. They have no curators, no registrars. I mean, mm-hmm. none of the people we're used to dealing with. They don't even, so they, and they've got a collection, like 20,000 things from oral histories right. to arc, all kind of archives. And then they have things from Hohokam to 1960s office machines. Right. I mean, it's just <laughs> that kind of place. So the the jobs did, and again, it's a few hours a week, and I, to try to figure out what to do with this asset yeah, for the community and, and that everybody who gave yeah. things there gave it with the intention that they'd be useful to in the future to the community. And it sounds easy, but it's not so easy to tackle this, particularly when you're just kind of doing it piecemeal. But mm-hmm. uh, so that's been interesting. I learned a whole lot of history. Oh, and, I bet. Um, got into a whole world. History museums are way different than art museums because mm-hmm. of the way they collect and the decisions they make, things like that. Mm-hmm. So, so that's been you know, just interesting from a museology point of view for me. Then you got a personal project, too. Yeah, I, I've been working for, well, three, three years plus, for, really. But before that, I... As museum director, my curatorial vein never went out of my body, <laughs> and I would throw things in files. Oh, this could be an interesting show someday. Right. I mean, you, so you just throw stuff in files. So when I retired, I went through a lot of these files, and I thought, I wonder if there's anything with legs. And and so one of the ones I wondered if it had legs was to look at uh, art about Hoover Dam because I'd seen some interesting prints over the years uh, and we bought a marvelous drawing by Helen Blumenshine mm-hmm. of Hoover Dam mm-hmm. uh, at the art museum. And I thought, yeah, I mean, that could be interesting. Maybe I'll do a small print show. Well, this small print project, proposed project, has become a monster project <laughs> going from uh, excavated material at the bottom of Lake Mead to you know contemporary art and film, television shows. I mean, this is an iconic structure that is um, still in the public eye today with this idea of uh, turning it into a battery that L.A. County, L.A. City is trying to do with the federal government right now to get things through that they could use an aqueduct to um, pump water from Lake Havasu into Lake Mead and then run it back through the dam because because of the low water level in mm-hmm. Lake Mead, which Arizonans, I'm sure, are pretty aware of. Right, it's uh, not going to go away. Yeah, it's not going to go away. It might improve, but it's not going to—I don't know that we'll ever see that. I, mean, I guess you never say never, but I, I think it'll be a long time before you see it full. I think they're only operating on like 18% or something mm-hmm. like that of the electric capacity. And there's this movement to go toward renewable energy and all this kind of stuff. So the idea is that if you pump water up and then let it flow, uh, Hoover Dam's a great location because its gradient is apparently deeper than most um, hydroelectric dams. Mm. So that's why it can generate a lot of power. And so, you know, they want to do that to, to be able to generate more power but make it renewable. Whether that'll happen or not, I don't know, but they seem to be pretty serious about it. So here it is. It's still, yeah. and, and obviously water management, uh, irrig- irrigation is somewhat important to us. I mean, be, particularly being in Phoenix, um, 
you know, the Central Arizona Project, and it comes down here to Tucson. I uh, don't know the statistics down here, but I, I think 40% of Phoenix water comes from Colorado River. Yeah, I don't think we're as high. We've got but, better aquifer stuff. Here. Yeah, but so these are very real uh, issues. Plus, architecturally, it's yeah. Very so I got involved. So basically, this project, if it ever really comes to fruition and, and becomes a book, would be the art of and about Hoover Dam. Um, and it's just, as I say, it's just fascinating. It's every time you um, lift something up, what scurries out <laughs> is really interesting. And the dam itself. I mean, there's so many first that came and it was so iconic that um, you know things we take for granted that are not necessarily art related but uh, Kaiser Permanente actually started because Henry Kaiser was one of the builders of the dam they Mm -hmm. had to build a hospital and there were these various companies that took on different side parts of the thing and he said he just said okay I'll build the hospital well he didn't know what was going to (laughs) happen but now it's Kaiser Permanente, and you know, so those are. There's your sponsor for the book. Yeah, <laughs> so um, and then Shea was in Shea Homes, um, Bechtel was yeah. it was involved. The Huntsman, the Utah companies. Right. So these are pillars of American yeah, industry uh, yeah, still today that made a lot of money off of the dam and brought it in. Um, a year and a half early and under budget. And I always like to say with a smile that like every other <laughs> federal project. Um, so it was from like 1931 to 35 yeah, kind of thing. They, and the dam was built from 31 to 35 and 36, <clears throat> the um, power plant was finished and they started generating electricity. Um, and they right, had a LA. big, they had a big ceremony of flipping the switch and, L.A. had a parade, and there was a you know all speeches and stuff, and they had ten thousand people yeah, I mean, that's, seated. That's amazing. When you in nineteen thirty six, in the middle of the depression, and there's these photos from the L.A. Times are just uh, spectacular of lights all over <laughs> or searchlights. It's like we have all this uh, power, but we have to remember that that wasn't the purpose of the dam. The dam was right. really built number one just to control. Uh, the Colorado River, because Colorado River flooded regularly, so you couldn't really have agricultural lands that would be washed away all the time, and it's very silt-driven. I, I don't know all the water lingo, but... Um, so between 1902 and 1905 or seven, I think there were three, like, 300-year floods or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's right. And... It actually changed the course of the Colorado River, so it no longer dumped into the Gulf. It dumped and created Salton the Salton Sea, yeah. which what water is still there, basically is still there from, yeah, from right. those years. Um, so that was a uh, real impetus. And then there was a couple of dam failures in, color, in California. So uh, they needed to build those. But it was mainly to... F- first and foremost, control the Colorado, <clears throat> and then provide irrigation, uh, consistent irrigation for what became Imperial Valley and right. Coachella Valley right. and all the agriculture up through there wouldn't exist if it wasn't, because the All-American Canal was actually part of the what was called the Boulder Canyon Project, uh, which is Boulder Dam, which then was changed to Hoover Dam later on. So you, you have that. Then the reason power came into play was that they could sell the power to pay for the dam. Mm-hmm. And they basically did it by bonds, and it's, it's been retired. So, I mean, it's a, yeah. and without a, a, that a genius kind of thing. And there was in, right? huge war between whatever it's called, Southern California Edison or something, because the belief back then, of course, was this should be private we shouldn't be you know, the federal government shouldn't be providing power right. it should be a private industry thing and there was back and forth the la times the chandler family was heavily involved and heavily against hoover dam why because the chandler family owned nine hundred thousand acres right below the border in mexico that they wanted this river in mexico to become the canal so that they're they're going to be taken care of uh-huh. 
Huh? Newspaper titans of the turn of the last uh-huh. century, but anyway, uh, so it's a you it's know a it's a fascinating critic, story, fascinating story which has hooked you. And one of the things I would say for those people who listen, if you have any interesting Boulder Dam, Hoover <laughs> Dam information, then you need yeah, to yeah get it to us. You know, but, get it to uh, yeah, I mean it's iconic. It's the same period as um, Empire State Building and Golden Gate Bridge, which ties to Maynard Dixon. Right. Uh, the interesting art thing around the dam, the, the Hoover Dam itself, is everybody assumes it was a WPA project. It was not. It was built by the Bureau of Reclamation. Many people believe it was built to create jobs during the, pre- the Depression. It did that, but the money had been approved in June of 1928 when the economy was screaming along. Right, so yeah. it was about power and water and business, primarily to Southern California. There was other, other aspects to it. Obviously, Las Vegas was uh, rekindled because of it. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway, I mean, it's, you know, it's a complex thing, and it's been really interesting to stay involved. But, so anyway, they, the Bureau of Reclamation, you couldn't hire an artist. Well, so they hired uh, a new architect to redesign the dam to make it modern. Originally, it was supposed to have eagles on top. Right. It was this Beaux-Arts kind of Colosseum-like look. And I, somewhere, somebody, I, nobody knows who, because there's great histories written about the building of the dam, decided to hire this California architect to make it modern. And he gave it that Art Deco yeah. kind of look. Um, he, in turn, wanted to hire an artist to help, but they couldn't hire an artist. But So they hired an, a painter by the name of Alan Tupper True, who is a very well-known Colorado muralist. Uh, and I'll just say cowboy Indian, kind of traditional Western right. subject, um, to get involved. But he was hired as the color consultant. What does a color consultant do? Well, the color consultant was doing two or three things. Up to that point, um, any boiler, any piece of machinery, I think it's true of bridges, was either painted black or sometimes kind of a yucky, silvery gray And sometimes in interior areas, they'd paint things that were dangerous, kind of a bright orangey red. Uh, Hoover Dam from the beginning was built to attract tourists, which is, again, something odd at the time. And True took it on to say, well, we want to make people feel comfortable. So he created this whole palette of the sage greens. Mm. And if you've ever been through the yeah. dam, it's really quite wonderful, the interior facilities. And then he designed these great terrazzo floors <laughs> with abstracted Native American designs. And those are all from tribes that abut the Colorado River. I mean, there's a whole thought out um, idea to all this no doubt you're doing this book i can yeah I can hear and, your the, voice. and the uh <laughs> and true i can't figure out I, I, well, I think i've figured it out but i can't prove it he was a friend of kenneth chapman's yeah kenneth chapman was kind of the founding curator of the anthropology lab yes, mexico, the museum thing. of new mexico and um and the School of Advanced Research. Yeah, SAR. And and he specialized. He did all this work in and did drawings of pottery and baskets from the top. So you saw all these designs, and what the floors this quite was often. Chapman that yeah, did this? Chapman did these, and he made some of these things commercially with cards, and he sent some of them to his friend in uh, Colorado. Uh, Mr. True, mm-hmm. who uh, there's a letter that thanks him for these things. And when you look at them, they're clearly the same kind of design work that uh, ended up on the floor. So I, I, but I got to find the smoking gun from a, <laughs> from a scholarship point of view. Right. So, you know, that's uh, what goes on. And then all the, the big winged Republic figures. Yes that are up on the uh, top of the dam and the terra- that beautiful terrazzo. F. Those were designed by a Swedish or kind of Scandinavian 
American artist named Oscar Hansen. And again, it says that he was selected through a competition. However, there's no record there ever was a competition. So some way or another, uh, at that point, the dam was able to be a little bit of a free spirit in the mm. way it was developed. And it was a public-private partnership, which I think that had something to do with it. They created the town of Boulder City, uh, was originally a federal reservation, which gave them, f- again, freedom to suspend to certain laws. Do, yeah. It was, And it was being close to Las Vegas. It was a... <laughs> dry town and uh, the the guy who was the sheriff if you will his title i forget um he was a town manager he basically had the ability that if you created a ruckus in town while you were off work to just throw you out of town no questions (laughs) asked and imagine this is 1933 and you're married and you have two children you're living in a brand new town with a brand new school that's funded with teachers, yeah, you, with a brand new hospital, yeah. so you have health care. Yeah, you don't want to screw and up. And you have um, everybody eats at the at the dorm like a college, three square meals a day. Yeah, in the depression. And meanwhile, you were you were pulling down like a dollar and a half a day, um, but you know, so there's a lot to. So Las Vegas got pretty wild during these <laughs> times, and Zane Gray wrote a novel about Boulder dam and he clearly had to have been on the inside some way for the observations but and it shows this pu- push and pull yeah. between yeah. life and so it's yeah it's pretty interesting and particularly photographically i mean i think it's is ansel adams photographed there margaret bork white robert frank edward weston yeah the you list know, goes you, on. you just kind of it's pretty intriguing charles sheeler did great uh two or three great paintings. Dixon did yes. 20 things for the PWAP program. I think he must have thought he could get that toward a mural somewhere, but that clearly didn't happen. Um, you know, and there's a few sculptures, not not so much. A couple of video pieces. So the Silver Streak movie, uh, you got to rent this movie. It is a hoot. So here, here's when was the, this time? 1933. Three. So that's right when they're building it. Yeah, and there's actually film of the construction, whether it came from the Bureau of Reclamation or they came out and shot it, I, I don't know. But there's actually they would have had to shoot it because they've got certain actors that are up on a couple of the catwalks up high that where they probably allowed them down a little bit, little bit out. Uh, but the, the story behind this is kind of uh, really wacky. So... Uh, the star of the exhibition, of the exhibition, the star of the movie is the Burlington Zephyr, and he's listed in the credits. Burlington Z- Zephyr was this streamlined Burlington Northern train mm-hmm. that was the fastest train in America, yeah, and they an and they did a cross country speed tr- trip thing. Right. So, okay, so that was real, uh, and then it was shown in the 1933 Chicago World's Fair as was a giant model and diorama of Hoover Dam. Oh, wow. Where's that? Uh, I think it's still at the Field Museum oh, wow. in, in Chicago. And then, at the same time, the iron lung, you know, was invented, basically, and mm-hmm. it was this thing for respiratory. and right, for it polio, was gonna, primarily. Yeah, so it was going to be... So it was a really important technology breakthrough, too. Okay, so now the... The movie is about the Chicago family that's the railroad family, and the son who doesn't want to go into the family business gets in a big brouhaha, and there's a little love life in there too. But anyway, (laughs) he says, I'm going to go off and work at Boulder Dam. So he goes off and works at Boulder Dam. He contracts some kind of, you know, disease, and um, he's given like 24 hours to live, and word goes back to Chicago, and they say, okay, we can fly the iron lung out there. And uh, then they go, oh, no, we can't fly the iron lung out there because it, it weighs <laughs> too much. <laughs> and the rail and the other young man involved in all this who wants to change the rail industry 
says, but we can get it there. <laughs> and so they mount the iron lung. They take the train literally out of the century of progress, put it on a track, and they race it and, of course, save the guy's life. Right. And all that. But it, it, uh-huh. uh, and well, it, who did that movie? I mean, was that done by the... Boulder no, no, it, no, it was it was, just uh, it a, was done. And then in 1941 or two, Alfred Hitchcock did a movie called Saboteur. And it was about the Nazi plot to blow up yes. the dam, which I guess was it wasn't ever even remotely moved toward execution. But it was a, an idea mm-hmm. uh, among in on the German side of World War Two that they could disrupt. Right, which Power. when you think about it, isn't much different than today with cyber warfare right. stuff like that. Well, and especially I guess because all the airplane companies were yeah. in L.A. and they're sure. getting all their electricity. Yeah, so yeah. It makes and sense. Uh, so anyway, there and then it went on all the way up to San Andreas and the Transformers. Superman, remember yeah, the original Superman? He's he put Hoover Dam back together. You know, so <laughs> and the Transformers yeah, grew in there yeah, from there or it, hidden there. But it, it's, it shows what an iconic place it is. Just pretty much like the Empire State Building is, and to a certain degree, I think the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm-hmm. So, and if you think, what would be the fourth one? I don't know that there is one that comes to my mind. I've tried to. Not I mean, from there's that a lot of frame. great buildings and things right. like that, but Price not something building. that's just an American, truly an American cultural right. icon. And it captured, I think it captured, you know, the world when yeah. they were building these things. Well, no sure. Doubt. Well, nothing had ever been built. And like, just think about it. If you think about cinematography, you know, you have, you know, Godzilla and, you know, King Kong and yeah. all these things from the Empire State Building. Yeah. Same with the Golden Gate Bridge, you know. So they, they're bigger than life. Right. So... Yeah. When can we expect that book? <laughs> it's not on the horizon. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like it's there, clearly there's time, in your mind. There's time, money. I live. I live a lot of it, and every day I try to, at least, even if it's thirty minutes, try to make a next phone call or whatever. Because other, otherwise, you keep trying to move the ball down the field. Um, you need a deadline, right? Yeah. Yeah. How about we can so, feature it here at Medicine Man Gallery? I'll give you a deadline. What do you need? Two years? Yeah. I'm too spoiled about doing museum things. If <laughs> I you know. if if you want to get the great things, you got to have the security. You know all these yeah, things that true. come with it, and you want to do it right. And there's some ideas, and a couple of publishers have talked about if you can write as well as you can talk about it, we'd probably be pretty interested. So I I'm confident it can happen, but I haven't. I, I'm not exactly sure what the right way for it to happen to it's full potential would be that'd be fun and you could break it up into parts and do some little things is this the first time you've officially said something in a public forum kind of like this yeah pretty much i did a the smithsonian um the director of this of the smithsonian american art museum asked me to come back they do kind of an interesting thing um, they do monthly lunch, brown bag lunches for their curatorial staff, and they invite the curators from different Smithsonian museums, and have, you know, a lot of like their postdoc people. And mm-hmm. so Stephanie Stivich, the director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, asked me to, said if you want, you know, you're coming, you have a daughter in D.C. and next time <laughs> you're back, if, we'll schedule the, that month's lunch for you if you want to test the water, right. which was great. So I gave a 30-minute lunchtime talk to about 18 people who right. were interested. And I was wanting, you know, to really get beat up afterwards with, you know, you, I can't believe you didn't remember this and you right. don't know about right. that. Yes. No, it's always none, a... of, none of that happened, <laughs> which I guess is good. It yeah. means that I, I'm on the right track. Yeah. Uh, but there was good support about it there. And I've uh, given a couple talks. Um, I mean, I... I'm on a list right now. The uh, Arizona Humanities Council sponsored a show for rural cities in uh, in Arizona from the Smithsonian. It's a plaque, you know, one of these. It's not an art exhibition about. It's called Waterways. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been, you know, done two or three talks with regard, excuse me, to that show uh, about just. Images of water in Arizona art. Mm-hmm. Well, so it's kind of a. I do have a question about the Boulder Dam versus yeah. Hoover Dam. I always call it Boulder Dam, but 
you know, it's well, also... Well, that's because you, you, you live in Maynard Dixon land. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, what is the, the correct first, name? The first name, well, Hoover Dam's the correct name today. Yes. The first name of the dam was given by Herbert Hoover's um, Secretary of the Interior who made a public announcement with no permission to do so that it was going to be called Hoover Dam. So it was called Hoover Dam briefly because uh-huh. uh, its construction started in the middle of 31. Well, 32, the world changed. Right, yeah. Um, so then it, very, then it was changed to uh, Boulder Dam because the, uh, there are two canyons in the Colorado up there, Boulder Canyon and Black Canyon. Mm-hmm. They're right next to each other. Black Canyon's downriver from uh, Boulder Canyon. So um, there were sites checked out in both places. The original idea was to put it in Boulder Canyon. So when the money, the, when the bills were passed, it was called the Boulder Canyon Project because mm. it involved what became the All-American Canal, involved some other stuff. Um, so when they politically wanted Hoover's name out of there, and they, right. um, they called it Boulder Dam, even though it was in, ultimately was built in Black Canyon. Um, so, and then in 19, I'll say 47, I may be incorrect, after the um, war and all, they realized that it was made more sense to call it Hoover Dam. And Why Ho- is that? Why Hoover had been chairman of the River Commission uh, beginning 1922 that... Um, set aside things. Remember, he's a Californian and he mm-hmm. was an engineer. So he was, um, you know, involved with it along the way. So it made uh, made pretty good sense to have it be him. And actually, uh, in 28, when the money was fronted... That was June of 28? But it would have been... Harding would have been still president, oh, I think. Actually. So, um, you know, Hoover, as the economy started getting screwed up, uh, you know, and people forget that a number of FDR's greatest ideas came from Hoover, that these were ideas, not from Hoover personally, nor were they probably FDR's personal ideas, (laughs) but the administrations of trying to make things happen. So they had this big project in the mill, so it was a way of trying to speed people to get work ultimately. Mm -hmm. So they sped the project up to try to uh, get it going. So uh, but that's why it was. It, it helps date things because people say, "Oh, well, you know, that's when." See, it says right there, Hoover Dam, and they were doing well. I said, if it was Hoover Dam, then it's after 1946. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not 1930s, right, right, the right. way you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so, so Hoover Dam is actually the correct. Yeah, Hoover Dam title. is the correct title, and it's. Um, you know, it still draws over a million people a year. And if uh, for people who are listening to this, if you've never been oh, yeah. really to go to Hoover Dam and stand on the dam and spend a couple hours there and take the tours, they're somewhat, they're not what they used to be because of um, security. Right. Um, and it's still just absolutely fascinating. And it is a um, visual icon. And if you go there... Um, go at, and try to go at night too. It's just I've never done that. The drama of because again, it was designed to be lighted at night from the beginning, uh. and nobody lives there. I mean, so I yeah. understand. I mean, they knew what they were doing, and that was for tourists, really. Yeah, and they they knew they wanted to do that because they wanted to bring attention to it. Bureau of Reclamation was under the gun at the time um, to maybe even be de authorized as a department or whatever. So they knew they had to hit a home run. Mm. So there's a lot of propaganda around Got it. They it. controlled the press imaging. This I mean, like Ben Glaha, the photographer, yes. was very careful about what they would photograph and what they wouldn't photograph. And so. Yeah, it's interesting, having known this now and thinking of Dixon's imagery, often some of it was not pro, you know, dam in the sense no. of you got tired construction workers hanging off the edges of trucks that are, you know, right. look like they're and, toast. And, and understand, they they worked 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Yeah, wow. And they had three shifts, had 5,000 workers at the top. 
They lived in Boulder City, which is 11 miles or whatever the mileage is. There were these trucks and buses that were mm-hmm. sh- shunning people back and, f- and forth. It was heavy labor. There were 90 some odd people died during the construction, none of which are buried in the dam, I mean, <laughs> nor could they have been big, yeah. based on how it was built. So that's a good rumor that everybody yeah. likes to always think is true. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a... Yeah, it's an iconic image. Yeah. Oh, we're we're going to wait to hear yeah. more about it from you. Yeah. We'll have the follow-up so when you have the, there your you book comes out <laughs> and the museum show at the yeah. Smithsonian. Or yeah, whatever. well, okay. anyway. So finally, I just want to kind of final finish up in the sense that I'd like to know what you how you see the museum world and museums themselves changing in this, you know, the 21st yeah. century because things have really... Our museums are different now, and the shows are different. Well, museums have always been changing places, and I, and I think just the way everything around us is changing more rapidly, you, you pick an area and it's changing quickly. Mm-hmm. Museums are, are certainly part of that. We touched on a little bit of it earlier about the relevance of uh, how do you make a art museum which is static, mm-hmm. relevant to people that are used to everything being video, instant, on your phone, you know, all, all this kind of stuff that are available to us. Um, I think the disruptive industry of the tech world has literally disrupted everyone's life. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, but that is a word that, you know, we're going to disrupt the mattress industry. We're going to disrupt the, the this. Name it. And I think there's a parallel to that probably after World War II where everything was mid-century modern. And think of all the new appliances that were available that with electricity and right. all that weren't. And you'd have to go back to the 20s because in that case, your disruption was from 1929 to 1945, really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so everything was new in the 50s. If you think of automotive design, streamlined design, all that kind yes, of stuff. everything. And it affected the art world. It affected the way museums. So museums used to be, in those days, almost like a visual library. So you were they were very um, reactive. And I think slowly, as change has occurred over the last several decades, you've seen museums become more proactive in all kinds of, just in the way you had to do business. And now I, th- I think it's equally true. We live in an era of political turmoil. We live in an era of identity politics. We live in uh, a moment where whichever side somebody might be on around political correctness and the way we label things, say things, affects the way you raise money, affects the way you educate, affects Mm -hmm. everything we do. So museums are trapped in the middle of all that. And I I don't mean, well, trap sounds ominous, but find yourself in this moment of how do do we navigate through this? So there's a lot of experimentation on with computers and with um, smartphones. How do you still keep attention on a static work of art and, and make people have a more active visit yeah. so you see museums that uh, are doing a lot more events they're um you know if you I, I think one of the museums that's doing the best job in america frankly is the museum of fine arts in richmond virginia mm. that has managed to capture both worlds really i mean it is a vibrant place with community activities on their grounds and all um, and yet maintaining really a variety of quality exhibitions. They have very solid funding. They're part of the state of Virginia. Mm-hmm. They're a big part of what they do. Um, but they really are capturing a lot of audiences. Indianapolis Museum of Art has the old Lily Estate that they're on the grounds of, and they've changed their name to New Fields, and they're really trying to use the outdoors. The White River goes through there, and they are, you know, now it's almost, it used to be like that was the outdoor side of the museum. It's almost reversed now, so there's some controversy there. But you see what they're trying to do. There's more music, dance, Mm -hmm. uh, the issues. Experiential. Yeah, and so experiential would be a perfect word. 
Uh, and then from a funding point of view, a lot of um, foundations and funding are, are focused around broadening audiences and uh, diversity, which I think art museums, from my experience, always were well aware of that and always working on it. That's in overdrive now, yeah, which sure. I think um, at the end of the day is a good thing. But the worry I see, and there would be discussions at the museum director's meetings before I retired, I'm sure they're still ongoing, is <clears throat> is the museum mission still being met and funded, or is the museum trying to get funding th from big foundations maybe that have a social agenda? Uh, it is the responsibility of a museum to reflect its community, be involved in its community, but there's a tipping point in there somewhere that um, the museum still has a responsibility, in my opinion, to collect great art, preserve great art, present great art in new ways. I mean, I have whatever you want to call it, um, and be sensitive to the community. It shouldn't be there to be a uh, social service agency that's supported by art. I mean, see, that's a, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's yeah. a pull there. It's always been there. Um, but, you know, it's, it has radically changed. There's a lot of um, things I read now and as a retiree. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I'm going, boy, I wonder how I'd handle some of these discussions that are ongoing if you see these trustee things where there's been protests to get trustees off the museum of modern art board off the whitney board in new york because of the the monies coming uh, per, particularly through pharmaceutical and the sackler right. money yeah. has been high profile about it but that's in the trade you're seeing other things go on in those arenas and we went through this a little bit in the day with cigarette when uh, mm. um, Philip Morris a big arts funder and ha how do you how do you deal with that and we you know so you, and how do you deal uh, with yeah that? carefully yeah I guess yeah because um, I mean, you have a moral because again and a, it's, but a business yeah you have a moral have responsibility to... in your community um, but when you have activist um folks who their real issue they don't they're using the institution to try to achieve what they're trying to achieve on let's say pharmaceutical stuff um, like Arthur I think it's Arthur Sackler died 20 years ago and there's places that are named for him and people are saying well we ought to take his name down what the, the opioid that everybody's so concerned about didn't even exist when he died yeah. so I mean that's like Okay, you're you're going way too far there. I mean, ha, where where is that? Where's that line? Where is that gray area? And I don't think that the companies probably set out to create the ultimate problem that exists. Now they've been more than uh, you know irresponsible on letting it go the way it did. So I I get the d discussion, but then you're in the middle and and the latest one i saw was to try to get the um, ceo of blackrock corporation off i think it's the museum of modern art board well blackrock is one of the biggest if not the largest i mean i'm not a finance person but uh, kind of mutual fund holding company in the world well, that that means they may hold stock in every american company Mm -hmm. So does that mean if you work for BlackRock, you can't be on a community, can't be on a nonprofit board anymore? I mean, I, see, that's right. And I'm I'm painting a picture for hyperbole, but I mean that that yeah. discussion's going on. Well, and occur. then the fellow that's CEO of of BlackRock, um, you know, also, and, and the issue around BlackRock is a protest over private prisons. Yes. And one of the companies that they have invested money in somewhere along the line is private prisons. Well, they didn't set out. They're not a private private prison company. They've invested in it and hold it. 
Well, that same company is held by in uh, Fidelity Mutual Funds, so therefore they shouldn't accept money. They shouldn't have any museum money invested in Fidelity Mutual Funds. Mm-hmm. Some might say, so, yeah. So some people would say, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Well, then you have a finance committee in, in Phoenix Art. I'll just use Phoenix Art Museum as what I know. You have a $25, $28 million um, endowment that you want invested to do well, but you can't take risks with, you know, you, you, so you got to be conservative investors because right. it's for the community. So a mutual fund's a pretty safe way to go, right. but if a mutual fund company owns, like, like right now, Johnson Johnson's all over the right. press because of Tal- talcum powder and mm-hmm. because of opioid, and I think there's another area. And you, I mean, we could probably go on and on. So any, so should you not, and I would guess Johnson and Johnson might be in almost any mutual fund you would, yeah, you would so. acquire. So are you saying we shouldn't do that? I mean, that there's got to be a resolution in the middle somewhere mm-hmm. that makes sense for everybody, and I think it'll be interesting to see. And it's not it affects art museums, but it affects any nonprofit. I mean, universities are stuck yeah, in the middle too. of it because they yeah. have huge endowments and with you know in some cases billions of dollars. Well, I also see museums just changing in the way they approach yeah. things, being interactive. I went to a Warhol exhibit not too long ago, yeah. and they had like you know balloons in there that were for that Warhol had done himself right. in his first exhibit, I think, when he had his exhibit in LA. And and the whole idea was take selfies, really. Yeah. You know, interact and which I did. I well, mean, you and know. you want people to post. So I mean we're yeah. using you know, we're doing things from a marketing point of view. We're using social media like crazy. And they're allowing photographs that um, they didn't use yeah, to do. Yeah, which as well. is what we should have done years ago. But that's really left over from the olden days of publishing in New York. They right. wanted to control all that. Um, and, you know, in an institution, you don't want really crummy photographs of your best works <laughs> ending up in a book somewhere. Right. You, you know, you'd like to control that a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. And just art itself, you know, how do you keep pace with whereas – Museums used to be kind of, I'll call it the Eurocentric canon. Mm -hmm. We now live in a much different world where um, you want to show contemporary Chinese art. You want to show contemporary Indian art. You want to show contemporary African art and Mm -hmm. European art and American art and South American art and and all. But can a museum be all things to all people? No. That's why you have exhibition programs. Um, But when things are flung far away. You've got costs. So the costs of doing business in a museum are much greater. The recent years where so much is the is based around prices of art. I mean, imagine there have been exhibitions that have had to be canceled because the value went up so much that the museum couldn't afford to insure them. Right, I could see that easily. So that's been a problem. Um, you know, or, or challenge, I guess I should say, is how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, yeah. so yeah. We're, well, you're out of that now. We're, so. we're out there. I have to <laughs> smile, and I, I sit there and think, oh, what would I do? What would I do? What would I do? And I, and then I can sit back and say, well, I don't have to do anything. I can just watch them suffer through it. But you know, on the other hand, it'd be fun to be in the middle of all that, trying to figure it out. Because what'll happen? We'll come out of this, and and all areas will come out with. Um, kind of a understanding of how social there'll be a, a consistent a consensus um, probably a consensus that has a sustainability to it that'll be terrific and then museums will get you know on the uptick right now I think outside of the giant you know L.A. County Getty I mean um, the Louvre those places that are real super right. tourist destinations yeah, art museum. but the Tucson Museum of Art the Phoenix Art Museum Denver Art Museum you know a lot of places that do great work and have marvelous collections and great staffs they're not beneficiaries of that kind of activity so that makes a difference yeah well and you also see these museums that are popping up like the museum of ice cream and things like that have yeah. you seen any of that have you gone to any of those well the, one They're of the first really ones was the spy museum yeah. in uh, washington which the inaug- the uh, founding director was a 
a friend of mine, Dennis Berry, who actually was, you know, Spy. He, well, no, he, <laughs> he, he was at the Cincinnati Art Museum that presented the Maplethorpe show oh, and wow. ended up in all that stuff. Yeah, but, I remember that very well. Um, but so that's a commercial venture. It's, well, it's and it's kind of look at Meow Wolf in Santa oh, yeah. Fe. It, not um, only in Santa Fe, they're expanding all and over. And now right? there's sl- slates to go into Las Vegas here in, Fe- in here in Arizona in Phoenix. Denver, I think, is uh, right. Denver's on the list now. How that'll play out as a venture capital thing and all that, yeah. who knows? Uh, the definition of art has clearly changed from kind of capital A art to lower lowercase art. Uh, which I think is in many, many ways healthy. If you're a curator, it makes it all the more hard to keep up with, you know, what can we do that could interest people? Right. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, you're always looking at new audience. I remember when we did uh, Curves of Steel, which was a automotive design I remember show. That. that was a great show. Um, and we were, I think, the second art museum to do something like that. We, along with the Smithsonian, we did a big show uh, before I left of uh, the, the art and video game design. Mm. If if you look at the credits on a video game, there will be probably two or 300 visual artists Mm. listed on that. And I think a lot of our brightest artistic visual art minds are going into digitization. I mean, Mm -hmm. not what we'd normally think of as museum stuff Mm -hmm. or presentations, but some of these uh, video games are breathtakingly beautiful and they get big crowds too, and right? yeah and they can get big money and now video they have video game tournaments that are now on espn oh yeah oh. and you know so uh, the whole idea of visual culture visual experience has has shifted and museums are still find trying to find their slot in there and it's hard because your governance is primarily older generation mm-hmm. who say they want to change, you know, you want to do that. But if it's not what you do and what you grew up with, you don't have a feel for it. Right. So there's, you know, how do you, how do you do that? And some places are doing better jobs than others. And they need to hire 31 year old museum directors yeah, at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's it. <laughs> All right, Jim, I'm going to let you go. It's so kind of you to take the time and uh, I'm really excited to uh, hear all the projects that you're doing, and you know you're not done. You may be retired from the Phoenix Art Museum, but clearly uh, you're still highly well, engaged. Well, there's a lot of fun things in life. I'm just trying to keep up with you. <laughs> That's funny. I'm trying to keep up with yeah. you. <laughs> all right, Jim Ballinger, director of the Phoenix Art Museum for well, 33 years, 33 years, and a curator, yeah. potential new uh, book author coming <laughs> out, and all sorts of things. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And we'll go Enjoy do dinner it. again. You bet. You bet. <laughs> Jim Ballinger, okay. thanks. You bet. Our dealer diaries. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.